MPNs are classically thought to be driven by JAK2, usually JAK2 V617F, which is uh, a mutation in exon 14 of the uh, JAK2 gene, uh, and then um, MIPL mutations, MIPL, MPL, or the thrombopoietin receptor, uh, and uh, uh, you, you know those account for a small percentage, and then cal reticulin, uh, where you can have exon 9 uh, deletions or insertions. Um, so that's, uh, th those are the big three, sort of. Uh, and uh, just to be a little bit more specific, when we are talking about the three classic MPNs, polycythemia vera is the most homogenous in the sense that 95% of patients have a JAK2 V617F driver, another 4% have a, a JAK2 exon 12 mutation as the driver. So there's very few that uh, 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 don't have a JAK2 driver, uh, extremely few uh, in, in PV. Now in um, myelofibrosis and ET, Roughly uh, 50 to 60 percent have a JAK2 V617F as their driver. 20 to 30 percent have a CALR exon 9 insertion or deletion uh, as their driver. And then a small percentage, 5 to 10 percent, have a MIPL. It's usually W515K or W515L. It's an exon 10. Those uh, uh, mutations uh, in MIPL can be the driver in a small percentage. Now, there are others, though. There are triple negative cases, so-called triple negative, borrowing from uh, that term from breast cancer, uh, obviously has nothing to do with that. But um, uh, those uh, patients, however, do have, for the most part, other evidence of clonality. So they, they, they're not going to have JAK2, uh, MIPL, and CALR canonical driver mutations, but they do mostly, most of them, have uh, other uh, evidence of clonality, such as ASXL1, DNMT3A, um, you know, TET2, EZH2, some splicing mutation. So you could get a, a clue uh, that, let's say you're evaluating somebody with a, a high platelet count. Uh, and you don't find JAK2, MIPL, or CALAR. But if you find one of these, then that definitely does, uh, you know, provide some evidence of clonality and suggest that this is not a secondary thrombocytosis. It's probably a real MPN. So, so you do, you do, you do see that. Um, uh, a, a lot has now been learned about prognosis, um, you know, especially I'll uh, just uh, point out that in myelofibrosis, uh, generally speaking, the type 1 CALR mutations, which are the deletions in exon 9, uh, they have the best prognosis. Uh, and uh, JAK2, MIPL, and type 2 CALR, which are the insertions in exon 9, they don't, don't uh, have as good a prognosis, although triple negatives have the worst prognosis. Uh, and this is in, in myelofibrosis, primary myelofibrosis. Um, similar in secondary myelofibrosis, actually. Uh, and then ET, we don't actually have evidence that the mutations make much of a difference prognostically. Where they do make a difference is that the CALR mutated patients with ET have the lowest risk of thrombosis. So that's, uh, that, that, that's important there. Uh, and then finally, uh, again, coming back to myelofibrosis, uh, uh, you know, where this is most pronounced or most relevant, there are non-driver mutations, some of which I alluded to earlier, that have prognostic relevance. So ASXL1, SRSF2, U2AF1, Q157, these are uh, really adverse prognostically uh, in, in primary myelofibrosis. There are a few that have been identified in PV and ET as well as being prognostically adverse, uh, you know, SRSF2, for example, in, in, in PV. But, but those are, uh, are less uh, practically important because those diseases uh, patients enjoy uh, a very favorable, uh, uh, you know, long-term survival and overall indolent uh, disease course.